Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to join all of you from Colombia. Thank you for the introductions, Dr. Rumi. And thank you, Dr. Steiner and Dr. Mugo for all of your support. And I'm very happy to join all of you with Beam. And Dr. Steiner is going to help advance the slides for me. So next slide, please, Dr. Steiner. So my pillars of strength, mom and dad. July 21st, 1982, my father landed in New York. The same day that I set, that he set foot in New York, that's the same day I was born in India. And it's a coincidence because the same day that he set foot in New York, I was born in India. And approximately 10 months later, my mother and I came and we settled in the US. So was it a coincidence or was there a purpose for a greater cause? Next slide, please. So imagine the following scenarios. Have you ever struggled to scratch your own back, mm -hmm. right? We all have that trouble. And at night, have you ever tossed and turned and struggled to find the most comfortable position to sleep? And then have you woke up in the middle of your sleep to use the restroom? And let me top this off. Uh, have you ever been in a situation where you're having an online meeting with your professor and nobody wants to disturb you, so they step out of the room? And exactly at that the same moment, a very clever mosquito finds a way to your room and bites you. And your advisor is watching you on Skype and he's helpless to do anything because he's in a remote location. These are some of the challenges I face on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's due to spinal muscular atrophy. Next slide, please. So spinal muscular atrophy, SMA, it's a progressive motor neuron disorder and affects the muscles closer to the center of the body it affects my respiratory muscles. I have a lot of breathing difficulties and I need assistance with all activities of daily living. And this is, requires 24 seven level of care. My mom is my primary caregiver and to assist my mom, I have a team of four caregivers. And one of my caregivers, uh, she's actually worked with me for the past uh, 10 years and I'm very grateful for her help. And Yolanda, she's worked with me for the past eight years. So both Hawa and Yolanda, which, uh, together combined, they worked for almost 18 years, right? This is a very rare thing because you know that worldwide there's a shortage of nursing, right? So this is very rare and very fortunate to have their care. And of course I have two more, Amanda and Miriam. But even with these four caregivers, the challenge I face is Life happens. Sometimes their car breaks down or one of their family members gets sick. So it's very difficult to find around the uh, clock care. And in those times, my mom still is helping me. So it's still very, very difficult, even though you have help. And although for SMA there's no cure, there is a treatment that was recently approved in December 2016 and it's called Nusernesern or Spinraza. And the challenge is the priority is given to pediatric patients and only few adults are receiving it. I'm actually on the waiting list for the past two years. So it's uh, challenging to even get access to treatment. And beyond this, can you believe, you won't believe this, the cost of the medicine is astronomical. Just for the very first year, of the loading doses, it's $750,000. And then each year following that, it's $375,000. So all of this, it's very challenging for insurance coverage. And you see, even though there's medical treatment available, it's very challenging. And even with caregivers, this is challenging. <coughs> Next slide, please. So, I want to take you back to my childhood. So as a child, it was very difficult for me to really understand my disability. 
I wondered why I couldn't walk. I wondered if I would ever walk also. And when I saw my brothers, Raj and Vic, grow up, I saw them walking, running, and I thought to myself, you know, they're doing it, why can't I do it? And I even thought to myself, maybe this is a temporary thing, and I was going to get stronger when I grow up. So eventually I understood the nature of my condition, and I understood I needed help. I have SMA, and this was going to be long term. And in uh, school, I didn't really have many friends. People would bully me, <laughs> right? It was very challenging for me too. And when people would bully me, I'll tell you what I did. I tried my best to ignore them. Then, if that didn't work out, I would run them over <laughs> in my wheelchair. So, <laughs> I was careful, but I didn't break your toes. Yeah, so things I did to defend myself. And I had a, a very wonderful uh, personal assistant mm -hmm. that was hired through our county school system. Uh, her name was uh, Robbie Atkins. I always remember, and we're still in touch to this day. She never treated me like a patient, but treated more as a friend or a daughter. And she always used to call me Lucy because of my sense of humor. And I called her Ethel in return. So we had that bond that went beyond the patient and caregiver role. And that really helped me to give, get a different perspective of the world. And that really helped, her, helped me a lot. <coughs> so during my school years, uh, I got progressively weaker. I could write by hand. I could turn pages in a book myself. I was able to do that. Eventually, it got to a point where I couldn't attend uh, school full time. So I had a homeschool teacher. She helped me a lot to uh, really excel in academics. She helped me focus in academics, uh, even though I wasn't there participating in the school. But she wanted me to really still excel in academics, regardless of my location. And that really changed. And I went to school two hours a day only. And then the rest of the time, I had a home teacher. And her name was Miss Jeannie Helso. And I really look back at those days and really appreciate all that she did for me then. And towards 11th grade, 12th grade, uh, I noticed all my classmates were talking about college, talking about job opportunities. For me, I didn't get that. Not, I didn't feel that people wanted to talk to me even about those uh, choices, the future choices of their decisions of what to do next. No one expected anything of me. But beyond that, one of the few people that talked to me about college was my guidance counselor. This is a friend, Demet, mm -hmm. and she encouraged me to apply for the Meyerhoff Scholarship. Mm -hmm. And that's where I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Rowski in this lecture week. Mm -hmm. And that was a really phenomenal experience for me because uh, that was the first time I ever uh, met somebody that really believed in my abilities. Dr. Rowski, the very first day I met him, mm -hmm. he gave me a lot of uh, positive affirmations he told me to focus, focus, right? And it really helped me to apply for the Meyerhoff Scholarship. And even then, that's the first time I really believed that I could do a PhD. So I really thank Dr. Roboski for his uh, encouragement at that moment. And of course, I had a lot of mentors from that time, Ms. Tai, Dr. Gowda, Ms. Evans, and Dr. Isha. Those, they all helped me to throughout the computer science and math degree of my dual major. <clears throat> and again, at that moment, Dr. Isha, she was the one that ins uh, inspired me to go to apply for grad school at UMBC. And that's how I applied and I got accepted. And the very first semester of grad school, I was able to come to campus with the help of my mother. She sat with, uh, sat in, in all my classes throughout undergrad and the first semester of grad school. Mm -hmm. And I'm really thankful for my mom for doing that because without her sacrifice to help me to come to campus, sit in all the classes with me, 
I would have never been able to do that before. And after the first semester, my health really, really worsened. I got very, very weak. It was very challenging for me to even come to campus. And I was at a point where I thought I couldn't continue my education. And for me, my life was my academics. My life was education. So it really made me worry that I couldn't do it. And I was really thankful for Dr. Nicholas. He came up with the idea of helping me remotely connect to the classes via Skype. And that really opened the door for me. Uh, with that ability to connect through Skype, that really helped me to connect. And that inspired the other professors in the computer science department to do the same. And that's how I was able to complete my coursework. And I'm very thankful for my advisor, Dr. Tim Oates. He also understood my challenges and understood that I have the drive to do robotics. So I'm very thankful for him as well. I also thank Dr. Rutledge, Dr. Tall, and Dr. Patty Ornett for their mentorship in helping me as well. <clears throat> so I want to talk to you about how I had the opportunity to try the beam. There was a UBICOM conference, and they were doing a pilot study on the telepresence initiative. And I applied, and I think out of 100 applicants, only five were chosen to test the beam. And I was very fortunate to get the opportunity to test it at that conference. And it gave me a really wonderful experience because for the first time in my life, I was able to stand. I was able to look at somebody at the eye level. And that was a really uh, transformative experience for me because I had never, never done that. So it really uh, gave me a level of confidence and I could move around freely. I felt, I feel actually more like the beam is an extension of me, my body. It's like an avatar for me. So that really made a profound change in my life. And I guess you can say it was a turning point in my life. So after that UBICON conference, uh, just to test the beam and to help pilot more studies and also uh, suitable technologies, they've been very generous in helping me get access to the outside world through their support for the beam. So I'm very thankful to them as well. So this is how my life has been so far, but there's still so much more that we have to do. There's so much, uh, so many more people we have to make an impact. Not only me, but we have to help a lot of other people. And that is my mission to help other, others with disabilities and seniors as well. A lot of people with mobility challenges need more help as well. Next, please. So, you know that anybody could have a disability at any time, because just think about it, right? Uh, any, if anything happens, like if you break your bone or if anything bad happens, right? You have the chance of experiencing a disability. So anybody can join this disability club at any time. And the World Health Organization actually right now estimates that, that about 1 billion people around the world have some form of a disability. And when you look at the senior population by 2020, there will be close to 2 billion people at the age of 60 or older. So people with disabilities and seniors, they experience a lot of barriers, economically, uh, environmental barriers, and social barriers as well. And robotics, it holds a lot of process holds a lot of promise to help people in their uh, life, to give them independence. And that's the goal of my dissertation. Next, please. So my dissertation focuses on three factors of safety, simulation, and a system. Our goal is to develop safety algorithms so that we can detect, prevent, and recover from potentially unsafe acts a robot can 
perform on the user. So, for example, if a robotic arm is grasp, grasping my leg too tightly, then uh, just based on squinting my eyes, it should be able to realize I'm in pain and it should let go. So we have to put all of this intelligence, intelligence of safety into the software. And that's what we're working on with respect to safety. OK, and second, we want to develop an accessible interface so people with reduced mobility or reduced dexterity can use the interface to control the robot effectively. Mm -hmm. Because right now, existing robotic interfaces, they use keyboard and joysticks. And that's very difficult for somebody that has limited hand movement to use. So my goal is to use speech, eye gaze, and we're also trying for a brain-computer interface in the near future. <laughs> so, and the neck, and also the interface. The, we want to integrate all of this into the robot, so we have a complete system that a remote caregiver can log into the robot and help the local user with the disability. And also they can test it. The local user can also control the robot to help themselves. So it will be a collaborative control the robot. So that's the goal of my dissertation. And the next couple of slides, I'll show you some of the robotic prototypes for independence and an interface that has accessible control to control the robot. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So now you see the piano mattress. It's an inflatable contoured mattress. It has inflatable air chambers. And it can be raised and lowered. And I'm thankful for Dr. Rothman and Dr. LaBerge, because students in their capstone classes, they completed a small scale model of this mattress. And it's available on YouTube for, to see. Uh, there's a video on my website. And right now, we're trying to build a large scale model. And we're actually looking for help. So if you're interested, please contact me. And you see my email address on the right bottom. And we can talk about building the large scale model. Next, please. <coughs> So in this prototype, this is the motorized commode chair. It can help with toileting and uh, the shower. And it has a joystick, so people can uh, shower, use the restroom with dignity. They have their privacy. And we recently received a grant from IEEE to build the actual prototype. Again, we're looking for help. If you're interested, please contact me. Next, please. So this is the accessible robotic interface. This can be controlled by voice. It's speech enabled. And the user has a view of three different camera views. The first is the XY plane, the top view. Second view is the YZ plane, the side view. And the third is the camera perspective from the robot's head. So in these three perspectives, it allows the user to control moving the robotics and effective to the exact location in the 3D world. And I'm thankful for Dr. Maya Kakmek at the University of Washington for this collaborative research. And this is actually the heart of my dissertation. And you see in this video, that's the Fetch robot that's located in Seattle, Washington. And I'm controlling it uh, more than 2,500 miles away from my home in Columbia, Maryland. And I was able to move the cereal box in the video so imagine the possibilities of what we could do if we, had, we can remotely operate a robot. So now in the next couple of slides, I'd like to show you some of the adventures that I've had on the beam. Next, please. <laughs> so I was able to defend my thesis proposal with the beam. And you see Dr. Oates, Dr. Nicholas, and Dr. Finan in the picture. It was a very historical event because no one has ever defended their thesis proposal using a telepresence robot before. So I'm thankful for that opportunity. And it was the first time that ever anybody has done their 
thesis proposal or defense remotely. Next, please. So <clears throat> I had the opportunity to be on the panel at the Computers Electronic Show, CES, Las Vegas. And it was a very incredible experience. Uh, it was a high profile panel. So I was very fortunate to be among, among that panelists. And you see that on the right side, that's the mega beam. It's 18 foot, 18 foot tall. It's a tall beam, much bigger than the beam that you see now. So that was also really an amazing experience because it's like you're on top of the tree and I still have the ability to drive. So people looked small to me. So that was a very different experience because like I said, I haven't even had the chance to look at people at eye level when I use my wheelchair. And then with the beam, the standard beam, I can see people at eye level. And with the mega beam, with the 18 foot tall, I can see people as very small, I can't. <laughs> So that was great. Next, please. I also had the chance to meet the French Minister of Digital Affairs, Madame Axel Lamar, at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, Spain. Mm -hmm. And that was a very, very interesting experience. I was very fortunate to meet her. Mm -hmm. And she was really happy to uh, know about my research and she encouraged me to do more in robotics and make a global impact. And a fun fact I want to share with you is she followed me on Twitter first, and now I'm following you. So that was a nice experience. Next, please. Recently, last week, I attended the Heidelberg Laureate Forum. Uh, this is a very uh, selective worldwide selection of with the selection rate of less than 10%. And 200 students are chosen around the world. I was one of them. And it's a gathering of all the laureates that have won the Abel Prize Fields Medal Touring Award. And it's a very, very sophisticated group of mentors, I can say. And I had the privilege to meet Dr. Vince Cerf. As you all know, he's one of the fathers of the internet. I was able to sh talk to him, share about my research with him, and also he provided me advice on how to improve robotic telepresence. <coughs> he explained that it's a great idea that you can connect to the robot, you can help people, and he encouraged me to also think about what happens if the internet has a delay, right? So he encouraged me to add a lot of intelligent software to make sure that have safety mechanisms, which is again addressed in my dissertation, to handle uh, delays in the internet. So I'm very, very thankful that I had the first-hand experience to talk to him and get his input on dissertation that's going to be coming out very soon. So uh, again, I want to encourage all of you to really think about robotics on a more global level. Next, please. So we have a call for action. We want to really launch programs that can solve humanitarian issues with the robotics. So we have a lot of problems in the world, and I really feel that robotics can solve many of those problems. So in that way, we can really promote social progress and elevate the global living standards, and that in turn can increase the quality of life for people with disabilities, seniors, and their families as well. I mean, just imagine just having no power. It's really unbearable to us. And when we feel helpless, we feel miserable. We want to find ways that we can be, I guess, self-reliant and be able to take care of our own self. And even though our perspectives are many and diverse, but vision is one. And this image that you see right now, I actually created that image for the UMBC Mosaic Center. So if you guys are near the UMBC Mosaic Center, stop by and take a selfie so I can see if it's still there. So I, please join me. And as we find a way to help one another out, make each other stronger, 
and make each other as independent and self-sufficient as possible. We need to find a way to prepare for the future, and we need to find a way to take care of our own selves with robotics. Okay. Thank you.